Gracious Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would be with all those who are hurting, all those who are confused and afraid, all those who are going through various trials and circumstances. I just ask that you would comfort them and give them peace. Give them, Lord, set down deep in their heart the desire to grow in grace and knowledge of you. We're thankful for the opportunity you give us to spend time in your word, to study your word together. I ask that you would filter out all of that, which is nonsense, but just seal to our hearts only the truth of your word, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi again, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We're going to continue on in our study in the book of Revelation. We're in the chapter we're in chapter 13. I want to spend a little time, more time talking about the subject that we uh, discussed in our last video. Except this time I'm going to throw caution to the wind and I'm going to tell you I just I really don't uh, care to continue on using uh, code words or, or uh, you know, secret uh, uh, let's just be out in the open with this, okay? Uh, come what may. It's, I find it very difficult to speak about this subject to begin with, uh, but secondly, I, I find it almost impossible to talk about this without just being straightforward about it. I want to spend some time with you folks uh, going over a list that I've compiled of, of 24, at least 24, what I believe are uh, evidences for our identifying this end times, revelation, antichrist system. The Beast of Revelation. And I mentioned in a past video how that the name of this religion, Islam, means submission. And I asked you folks to think about why or how that there could be some significance to the, to the name meaning submission. It's apparent to me, overly apparent, that as it regards our own Christian faith, that the believer is under grace, not law. And I understand that believers in Christ are to be submissive in the sense that we're to be uh, subject to the Word of God, we're, we're to be submissive to God, uh, to the leading and the direction of the Holy Spirit. But when it comes to our actual relationship with God, which is based on faith, not works, submission takes on an entirely different character, but not so with Islam. Just to be, I guess, short and concise and to the point, In, in our relationship with Christ, in the Christian faith, we know that legalism is uh, defined as, as living our lives under the principle of law-keeping as a rule of life. Uh, we operate, we function according to the flesh, we walk according to the flesh, not according to the Spirit. It amounts to wood, hay, and stubble, not gold, silver, and precious stones. The fact of the matter is, despite what most Christians, I, I believe, today uh, believe, we are not under law, any form, any principle of law whatsoever. We died to the law that we might live unto Christ. So submission in that sense is not biblical. And so what we're looking at with Islam is, and we see it in the very meaning of the name Islam, is submission, legalism, 
on steroids. And I, and I, I would I would say that even that doesn't go as far as as it should in in defining the term submission as it regards the religion of Islam. So I just wanted to point that out. So I'm going to go through these, and, and I hope that you don't find this boring. I hope that you find this enlightening. I hope that you find this helpful. I believe that we are at a time, we're living at a time in which we need to know this. If God did not intend that we understand this, then all of this would be hidden from us. But the fact of the matter is it's not. We can know, and we can benefit by knowing. And I understand, folks, all of the, the arguments uh, concerning this identity of this end times, revelation, antichrist system, and how varied the opinions are. I understand that. But I'm going to tell you that the, I've looked at this for years. The weight of the evidence is that it's related to the second largest religion on the planet, Islam. And I think that you'll see as we go through this, for, it's for very good reason. It's, it's almost a common sense discussion. I want to talk about the, the, the Daba. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the Daba in Islam which is, they use that term to refer to uh, as the beast. The Daba will emerge from the earth. In chapter 13, where we're looking at a beast that rises up out of the earth. In Islam, this is the Daba. It emerges from the earth. It shakes the dust from its head. It will have with it, according to the writings of Islam, it will have with it the ring of Solomon and the rod of Moses. And people will be terrified of it, and they'll try to run away, but they won't be able to escape, because such will be the decree of Allah. It will destroy the nose of every unbeliever with the rod and write the word kafir, unbeliever, on his forehead, it will adorn the face of every believer and it will write the word Mumin, faithful believer, on his forehead and it will speak to people. Allah says in the Quran, and when the word is fulfilled concerning them, we shall bring forth a Daba from the earth to speak unto them because mankind had no faith in our revelation. This I'm reading this. This is from the Quran. And in Revelation chapter 13, right here in this chapter, He, the false prophet, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand. That's also translated arm, or on their foreheads, where no one could buy or sell without this mark. That is the beast, the name or the number that stands for the name. The Hadith states the task of the beast will be to distinguish the believers, the Muslims, from the non-believers with Prophet Moses' staff. It will draw a line on the forehead of every Muslim believer whereby his face will become bright and luminous and with the ring of Solomon it will seal the nose of every non-believer whereby his whole face will become black. So there will be complete distinction between the Muslim and the non-Muslim so that if any or if many parties, if many people sit at a dinner table, the Muslim and the non-Muslim will be distinguished from one another. This is their own words. This is in their own words. So I'm going to say that the Daba is... Number one, that's number one on my list, as what I believe is evidence that their beast is the beast of Revelation. Muhammad himself, 
stated that at judgment, Allah brings forth a badge or a mark that he gives to the Muslim and written across it is, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. And this badge, this mark, will save the Muslim from damnation and it must be worn on the right arm or the hand. The Greek word for mark used in the text is chiragma, which is translated a scratch or a etching, a stamp or badge of servitude. Strong's 5480. The Greek word for right is dexios, which means one's right hand or side, which includes the arm. And Muslims today are already wearing marks as badges on their foreheads and their arms in servitude to Allah and Jihad. The only thing left to be instituted is the official mark, which will be linked to buying and selling and worship of the beast who claims to be God. And there will be no forgiveness for those who take that mark. I want you to take serious note of what our text says. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding stop. Wisdom and understanding. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. That word number can mean multitudes. Calculate the multitudes of the beast, for it is the multitudes of a man. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number total, the number total of a man. That can mean a race or group of mankind. Folks, I'm looking at strictly at the original Greek text, and I'm giving you honestly the definitions of these words. The number total of a man can mean a race or a group of mankind. Count means to vote. It's the word was used where pebbles were used in casting votes. Okay? Count by ca calculation. Calculation. And this takes wisdom and understanding. Either Muhammad or the seed of Ishmael or Satan. The use, folks, the use of symbols, emblems, hieroglyphics, even, and even riddles was common in ancient times. It was common. I want you to take note. If it was merely the counting of a number, a third grader could do this. It wouldn't take wisdom and understanding, much wisdom and understanding. If it was merely the counting of a number, it would not require wisdom or understanding. That's my point. If it had to do with numerology, it would not require wisdom or understanding, folks. It wouldn't, okay? We sh and we shouldn't ask why the identity should not be more plainly made. Well, Lord, you could have just come right out and said, you know, We compute, we count, we calculate in the sense that of how. How do we do that? How do we count the number? Count. How do we count? Calculate. Okay? How do we do that? Compute. How do we compute this? I believe in, in the sense that we study the word to know the answer. That's how we count the number. We calculate. Okay? I believe that is what the text is saying. The description given in Strong's is that these are three Greek number symbols. Okay? Chi, Ki, Stigma. Alright? And that these letters are used as numbers. Okay? 666. Six, six. Now, this confusing description, along with the fact that there are clearly three symbols, but all are given the same heading and strongs is really pretty strange. As if the translators really didn't know what these symbols were, but they tried to force them into the Greek language. Okay? 
I'm going to suggest that these are not Greek symbols at all, but rather that the Apostle John saw the symbols of another language that he faithfully wrote down, not knowing what they were. If you go to the oldest manuscript of the New Testament in existence, the Codex Vaticanus, you see these symbols as being less Greek and more something else. I believe these, sim these symbols represent an entirely different language than Greek. Taking the context of, of Revelation 13, where it's being revealed to John what the mark of the beast is, it is possible that the mark, name, and number, multitudes of the beast, could be in the language of the beast. I mean, John often described things that his first century mind couldn't comprehend war machines and, and technology that would be like magic to someone from his time. He faithfully wrote down what he saw and he used first century language to describe 21st century technology. The language of the Islamic beast is Arabic, just as the language uh, of the Greek beast under Alexander the, the Great was Greek. Although the New Testament was written in Greek when God showed John the mark, the name, the number of the beast. I believe he showed John in the beast's own language, Arabic. Hang with me, folks. This gets better. The most common symbol in all of Islam, like the cross is to us, is called Bismillah. Okay? In, in, in Arabic, it means in the name of. Okay? Bism means in the name of, and, and Ilah, or Allah, is Allah. So this symbol, Bismillah, Bismillah, all right, in the name of Allah. If you buy any copy of the Quran, or you go to, to any Islamic website, you'll find this symbol there. This symbol can be it can and has been rotated all degrees, different ways in in the in Islamic literature, and it has the exact same meaning, same emphasis, no matter how it's rotated. Also, the arrow-like line that's pointing upward on the right side is often drawn elsewhere on the symbol through the center, to the left, or or not at all, depending on which Arabic writer is doing the writing, but you do a search for Biz Bismillah on the internet and you'll see the several variations and you compare that with the middle symbol found in the, in the Codex Vaticanus of Revelation 13, 17. Folks, listen. 666 has led to nothing but confusion and ridiculous speculation for centuries. It is not about gematria. It's not about numerology. It's about imagery. Okay? It's about symbolism. The second most common symbol in Christianity is the fish. So we have the second most common symbol in Islam, the crossed swords, okay? Which is used to denote military conquest. Putting the mark of the beast together in Arabic, we, we, we get, in the name of Allah, there will be jihad. Consisting of hordes, multitudes of Islamic warriors, just like the glory days of the caliphate hundreds of years ago. So the mark will contain both the name of the beast and the numbers, multitudes of people who are part of and worship that beast. And we know in Revelation 20, those who do not take this mark will be beheaded. And Islam is the only major religion that still beheads people. And as you know, well, we ourselves witness these types, these this type of beheadings. We, we, we witness this stuff on news networks satellite, television around the world.
on Islamic flags, we find the Greek X, which John wrote. The very X which John wrote, we see on Islamic flags. And Islam doesn't even deny that 666 is connected to them. In fact, they proudly claim that it's connected to Muhammad and the Quran itself. Islam itself claims that 666 is a holy number. The Quran claims that it's the truth and the Bible is corrupt. Just the exact reverse. How much today, folks, are you seeing that's been reversed? Muhammad was a man who advocated the oppression of women. This is the meaning, I believe, of Scripture which declares he will have no desire for women. That's not saying that he's a homosexual. I'll explain more on that later. The mysterious eighth kingdom, Revelation chapter 17, is this revived Ottoman Empire, the deadly wound that was healed. Most Christians are, are unaware of just what Islamic end times theology says about our Lord Jesus Christ. Christians today need to see what they are saying about our Lord. This is the last day's strong delusion, okay, that God sends upon people that will deceive even the very elect, said our Lord. Christianity and Islam are diametri just diametrically opposed to one another. What one holds to be sacred, the other views as blasphemy. The angel Gabriel told Daniel, the prophet, that the closer that we come to the second coming, the more God would reveal about the end times to his people. This explains the admonition of our Lord, let him who has wisdom understand. Islam has their own version of the end times in the last seven years. Muhammad took everything held as holy by Christians turned it completely around and called it truth. This is fact, folks. And then there's the Mahdi. Muslims are looking for the return of Imam al-Mahdi, the Islamic Messiah. According to Islam, the 12th descendant of Muhammad is being held in a well deep in the earth, hello, from which he will ascend and rise for the final seven years before judgment. At the beginning of that seven-year period, he'll come out of the well and he'll, he'll begin to establish an Islamic world empire. This, this world empire, this world order will dominate the entire world through false peace and then military conquest. Muslims say that their Mahdi's name will be Muhammad bin Abdullah. The Bible calls the Antichrist, the beast who comes up out of the abyss. The similarities to the Mahdi, which is also said to ascend from an abyss, is too coincidental. If you're watching this video and you are seeing these things begin to occur, you will hear people saying that Jesus has returned. They're telling you he never died, but he was caught up to heaven by Allah, but that Allah has sent him back to earth. You'll hear it said that he lied to everybody, that everyone misinterpreted what he said, and that he never claimed to be Allah's son. Right now, you're probably hearing him declare that Islam is the way, the truth, and the life, and that you must convert to Islam or die. But what they are telling you is a lie. What you are witnessing is Satan's counterfeit religion to Christianity, which was the truth that you failed to hear. And soon he and Mahdi will team up and systematically kill all the Jews in the world and force everyone else to convert to Islam or die by the sword. If you should survive this period of tribulation, you will see the Mahdi and Muslim Jesus gather their armies together to, to fight the Dajjal, but I want you to know this. Though they will claim that their Dajjal is their Antichrist, 
He is the true Jewish Messiah. And he is coming in the clouds to rescue his people, the Jews. They are telling you that their great army will fight against the Dajjal and win. And that in the end, the world will finally be at peace. Don't believe them. They're lying against the truth. Islam's Antichrist is the true God of heaven who will be victorious in the end. A bit of history here. 68 AD, the Jews rebelled against Rome. Rome sent the 10th legion commanded by Titus to, to squash the rebellion. In 70 AD, Rome won in complete fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel. Historical examination of the Roman 10th Legion proves they were not from the western half of the empire, but the eastern half, which was the Middle East. Titus was the commander of all the eastern legions and not the western. The Roman 10th Legion that destroyed Jerusalem and the temple consisted of Arabs, Syrians, and Turks, all of which are now Muslim countries. This is history. This is fact. There are many names given for the Antichrist, son of perdition, man of sin, etc. Some of the names are ones that speak to his lineage, such as the Assyrian, king of the north, and king of Tyrus. That biblical perspective is geographically and spiritually from the standpoint of Israel, not the United States or any other country. The Antichrist must come from the north of Israel, which leaves Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, or Russia. There is absolutely no, no scriptural evidence that he comes from Russia, even when you take things as allegorically as possible, which leaves Lebanon, Syria, and Turkey. Ancient Tyrus is modern-day Lebanon, which leads us into his next name, the Assyrian. If you check your old Bible maps, all three of the aforementioned countries were part of the ancient Assyrian Empire. More evidence for Islam. This being Islam. Folks, he changes times and laws. I'll bet you there's not, there's probably not very many Christians who will read that and stop and just spend time pondering those words and shall intend to change times and laws. Daniel chapter 7. Islam has its own set of laws called Sharia law, and these will become the rule of the Islamic empire, replacing any other laws and rules that nations have established. Time-wise, most of the world operates by the Gregorian calendar, which includes B.C. and A.D. The Muslims, however, operate by a different calendar. Mahdi will force everyone to be subject to this calendar. Okay? Different law, different calendar. He changes times and laws. He will reject old gods. He shall regard neither the gods of his fathers nor regard any god, for he shall exalt himself above them all. Some translations say, God of his fathers, which led many to falsely believe Antichrist. Well, he's got to be Jewish since the word God is singular. Well, the Hebrew word used there is plural. Gods. Plural. Not God. So it should read, He, the Antichrist, shall not regard the gods, plural, of his fathers. Before Muhammad and the Arabs worshipped, I don't know, uh, over 300 gods. And Allah was the moon god. So the, the, that's the crescent moon on the Islamic flag. Muhammad came along and declared all the other gods to be false and that Allah was alone in his godhood. Okay? I pointed this out in, 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 a, in a, I think in my last video. So Muhammad did not regard the gods of his fathers, and neither shall the Mahdi, the Antichrist Mahdi. 
He does not regard desires of women. Okay? Sharia law is very oppressive and denigrating toward women, and it was created by Muhammad. We know he'll be a master deceiver. There are many verses that, that state that, that this Antichrist, Mahdi, will be deceptive. He'll successfully deceive many, even the very elect, as Jesus put it. Well, Steve, does the Quran say that lying is a sin? Yes, it does. The Quran says lying is a sin, but the context is one Muslim lying to another. That's not that Muslim lying to you. They are commanded to conceal their Islamic faith to a non-Muslim. And this deception includes speaking lies and spreading disinformation in any form. This is why terrorists lived and worked in the USA, probably still do today, until one day they're caught in a plot to blow something up. The Mahdi Antichrist starts off as a man of false peace. He may even play down or deny his own Islamic faith to deceive Israel in the West. He'll be a military leader who likes war. Daniel chapter 11 shows that that, that Antichrist honors the God of forces. And Revelation 13 shows people amazed at his military power, saying, who can make war with the beast? And when? In the Quran, Allah demands war against unbelievers and especially against Jews and Christians. The Mahdi and Muslim Jesus are predicted in Islamic end times theology to make war on all those who do not convert to Islam. He persecutes Jews and Christians. This chapter, Revelation chapter 13, makes it clear Mahdi, Antichrist, makes war on the saints and prevails against them. He fights against other nations. He shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign god, says Daniel. That verse is fascinating because it clearly shows that Antichrist will have the opposition even before Christ returns from the strongest nations who also worship a different God than his. Back in Genesis, God himself prophesied over Ishmael and his descendants. It all, folks, it goes back to Ishmael and his descendants. The Arabs. That he'll be a wild man. Folks, it was predicted that his hand would be against every man and every man's hand against him. Islamic end times theology states Mahdi will fight against all unbelievers in the, in the attempt to convert them to Islam and establish a worldwide Islamic order. Only the Mahdi fulfills all the characteristics and actions of the Antichrist. You won't find any other figure in history that does. Dearly beloved, we see this Islam connected to this end times Antichrist system in the seed of Ishmael, the seed of the serpent, that pro because prophecy is Middle Eastern centric, it's not European centric. We see it in when we look at the Roman 10th legion. We see it in the Daba, the beast that rises from the earth who speaks, the Mahdi, the Dajjal, the number 666, that Satan is a master deceiver, that God sends a strong delusion to believe a lie, the mark of the beast, the revived Ottoman Empire, the deadly wound that was healed, the fact that the Antichrist rejects the gods of his fathers. It's all now just one God, Allah, not many 360 some odd gods as it was before. The deadly wound that was healed, the revived Ottoman Empire. He changes times and laws. Islam loves war. Their, their feet are swift to shed blood. 
Islam beheads. We've got Islam and nine, the 9-11-2001 connection. Everything's reversed. Jews, Christians, bad. Islam, good. If you don't see that increasing, if you don't see that reversal increasing, you've got your eyes shut, folks. If you don't see blasphemy, good being called evil, evil being called good, which is the very definition of the word blasphemia in, the Bible, in your Bible, if you don't see that, you've got your eyes shut. If you don't understand, if you haven't come yet to understand that Islam is the second largest religion on the planet, and we're talking about the, the church being removed, what does that leave? You've got your eyes shut. Turkey, the second largest army. Hello. If you don't see that, you've got your eyes shut. Even today, the Prime Minister of Turkey, Erdogan, sees himself as the one to head this revived Ottoman Empire. He hates Christianity. He hates Jews. He hates you. Okay? Whether it'll be him or his a successor, I don't know. But he comes out of Turkey. Your Bible says he comes out of Turkey. He doesn't come out of Rome. He doesn't come out of the Vatican. He doesn't come out of the White House. He doesn't come out of your neighbor's basement. Okay? He comes out of Turkey. It is Middle East centric, not European centric, not North America centric. Do not be deceived by the multitudes of videos out there that are trying to tell you that the Antichrist is some person that pops up out of South Carolina. There's the Psalm 83 war. All the members of the Confederacy, the, that Confederacy, the, the, the nations that surround Israel today, the border nations, detailed in Psalm 83, all of them are Muslim, folks. Each of them is the subject of specific judgments, which, which are detailed in, in Ezekiel. Who does he fight, folks, against at the second advent? Take a look in your Bible. Who does he fight against? Here's a news flash for you. They're all Muslim nations. He is seen coming out of Edom with his garment, his garments drenched in the blood of Islam. Okay? I'm talking about your Lord and Savior, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is seen coming out of modern day Jordan with dyed garments from Basra. We are right now seeing the the the, the mindset of this Antichrist system permeate, infiltrate, dominate every, just about every institution, every organization on the planet. If you don't see that, you, you've got your eyes closed. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him what Christ desires most of us above all else is that we trust in Him. I thank you all for all of your prayers concerning the direction of this ministry, my health. Know that I pray for you all constantly. Until next time, thanks for watching.